the one of the more famous well-known Christmas carols, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. And that next line repeats this way, let heaven and nature sing, right? So in response to the fact that Jesus has come, we're, we, we have a need and a response to sing that back. And uh, you say, why is that? Because if you don't intentionally go after joy, if you don't intentionally grab hold of it, you always be left grasping for it. And so the great truth at Christmas is joy is out there. It's not just going to fall into your lap. You have to go after Jesus. You have to pursue him. You have to worship him. And if you do, that joy will break into your life. And and see, your joy has more to do with what and where you are in relationship with Jesus than it does to your circumstances. If you're depending on your circumstances to produce joy, you're going to have a lot of heartache. If you are depending on Jesus, joy is possible in spite of what your circumstances are. Let's pray together. Father, we come in this Christmas season singing about Jesus coming. We pray that the truth of that would break into our lives in in such a deep and profound way that it transforms us. It actually builds and gives us hope. It causes us to live as though we are not people of this world, that we are actually born and fit for a world to come, and that we have the joy and privilege of telling others about you. Meet with us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Really glad that you're here. Let me just do a couple of quick items. I know we got some uh, things at the end of the service that we'll talk to you about. I, I was incredibly encouraged uh, this morning. Tommy and I are always busy on, on Sundays. We kind of pass back and forth with each other, um, particularly in the 9 o'clock hour. I, I met so many new people already this morning. That's such an encouragement. We're really glad you're here, and uh, we want you to know we want to help you connect. And uh, so if you'll find us after this service, and uh, we're not going to be hiding. We'll be actually be in the plaza area. would love to just get a minute of conversation with you, see what we can do to help you have a great experience, particularly during the Christmas season. Uh, there's a lot going on. We'll, we'll talk about this at the end. Our Christmas uh, Eve and uh, or Christmas Eve services schedule, which is not technically all on Christmas Eve, but it'll be uh, Saturday and Sunday, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and that schedule is out. There's uh, there's ways for you to promote that. We'll talk about that at the end of the service. Here, here's what I would do: everybody that's family, friends and connected to you, neighbors and people in your life, invite them to come. People are hungry for spiritual reality in their life today. And just a little bit of an invitation, you'll, you're going to find people come. We, we've seen this over the last several weeks. Just be intentional about that. If you're a member of our church, new to our church, been, been here for a little bit, let me talk to you just a minute about the Christmas offering every year. Uh, Christmas season is a big time for us. We get to end of year giving. A lot of the money that uh, it takes for us to do ministry across all of our campuses comes in in the month of December. So we're asking every regular attender and regular giver to do something over and above their regular giving. Christmas envelopes are out. If you did not get one, you can pick one up. And uh, I trust that you will join with me to give. You know, if there's, uh, just just think about it this way. If, if, if 500 people gave uh, $200 each, we'd easily hit the $100,000 goal that we need could go well over and above it. Now, if you're not a regular giver, you've been attending for a while, perhaps you've gone through a membership process, you've connected a little bit deeper, but you're not giving, let, let me use the Christmas offering as a season to encourage you to start regular giving. And, uh, you know, financing the work of God is such an important thing. It doesn't depend upon one of us. It depends upon all of us just doing our part faithfully, consistently, and that can make a huge huge difference. And if you want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to do so. And uh, if you are new here, we're way more interested in you than your money. <clears throat> God has a way of working in your life, and uh, we want to see that happen. Let me make one personal uh, observation comment. I don't normally do this, but but uh, sometimes things are, are noteworthy. Uh, today, my father-in-law is here in church. Now, let me explain this. He watches online every week and is highly engaged and would be here if he can. He's gone through a lot of 
physical issues, but he made the effort today. And uh, would you give him a hand? He's just first time in about, <clears throat> I guess, close to, to four years uh, since that he's been able to be out and in church. So we're really, really grateful and uh, thankful to God for that. If you know him and have connected with him, I'm sure you'd love a moment just to reconnect with you. And uh, he has spent the vast majority of his, his life in ministry here in our church, and uh, we're thankful for him <clears throat> and uh, glad that he's here. Luke chapter 2. We're in a three-week series. Uh, I love this series. Actually, it's not often that I don't come up with series ideas. Um, our teaching team, uh, campus pastors from all our campuses, did some work on this series, and I think that we're trying to uh, make it hard for me to do my study during this month. They, they chose what I would call some fairly um, obscure parts of the Christmas narrative, and uh, they themed it around the light of the world. I love the theme, and I really, really enjoy, one of my favorite things to do is to teach less familiar passages of Scripture. And uh, so we're going to jump into one today. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a... Uh, uh, a warning, maybe kind of set the stage. Um, <clears throat> this sermon is going to start a little slow, and and it's going to be a little slow because I really want you to understand where we're coming from. It it does it it gets slow and then it gets painful. Okay, so I'm just warning you: it's slow and then painful, and then hopefully, can't guarantee this, but hopefully it ends with a bang and. Uh, now, that bang could be you wanting to shoot me and say, hey, that's it, I'm done. Or maybe it's the Spirit of God bringing the truth home to your life. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, light of the world, the hope of Christ coming. There's some, some little bit unfamiliar language in here and, and some, some things we don't normally think about. So I'm going to go a little slow. Verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now, Simeon is, is not random to the story, but he's not... He's not central to it. He's, he's kind of he's peripheral to the whole Christmas narrative. And the Bible says about him that, that the same man, Simeon, was just and devout. So he was a righteous man. And when the Bible uses that term, he was not righteous in the sense that he was moral. He was righteous in the sense that he was living under God's righteousness. He had submitted himself to, to the teaching of the, of the Word of God, and he was devout. In other words, he, 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 he took... He took the matter of pursuing God very seriously. And he was, the way you know that, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. I want you to underline that phrase, waiting for the consolation of Israel. It, it refers specifically to what we would call the, the coming of Jesus, the advent of Jesus. And in the traditional first century pre-first century mind, so think when this was written, looking toward the coming of Jesus, they would not have seen a, a first coming and a second coming. They would have just seen the coming of Jesus. So it would have all taken place at once, right? So whatever was going to happen was going to happen as a result of Jesus coming. And, and to him, it brought consolation, hope, comfort, encouragement. It's, it's really an eschatological end time view saying, hey, when Jesus comes, or when specifically when the Messiah comes, all my hopes and dreams are going to be fulfilled. Everything that I'm looking for and longing for is going to happen. Verse 26, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him, Jesus, up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart or die in peace according to thy word. I, lo I love this, right? He's saying, hey, if I die right now, I'm going to die a happy man. If I, nothing else has to happen in my life for me to be able to die in peace. He's holding on to the Christ child and he's saying, all my hopes, all my dreams, everything I've put my whole life 
on have, have come to reality, have come to fruition. Jesus is my hope. And you think, man, that's so true, right? When a baby's born, doesn't it give you the warm and fuzzies? Right? Doesn't, when a baby's born, doesn't that just make you think, hey, what could go wrong? Right? The whole world is right. He says in verse 30, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And by the way, not just Je uh, Jewish people, but all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of. And so now they're over there thinking, okay, here's this, this very godly man. He's holding up Jesus to the heavens and he's blessing God. And he's, 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 he's pronouncing a benediction, a blessing over the life of Jesus. And then he turns to Mary and Joseph and he blesses them. Speaks a good word over them. By the way, you, 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 you don't know part of, part of why you need to be in church. I love what Mark has done the last couple of weeks. How do you greet people? Don't ever underestimate how important it is for you to speak a good word over people, right? They need it. It's just, I mean, a good word can simply be, hey, I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad God's working in your life or I'm praying for you. That's a good word, right? And so Simeon blesses them and speaks a good word over them and says to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now here's what he's actually saying. You do not know how good this is going to be for many people that Jesus has come. And at the same time, you do not know how bad this is going to be for people that Jesus has come. Now that's different, isn't it? I mean, like, like you know, part of pastoral life, pastoral care sometimes is you go visit people in the hospital when they've had a child right everybody likes the part hey this is the most beautiful child you've ever seen nobody likes the part you don't know all the good that's fixing to come and you don't know half the bad that's fixing to come and if you had to be married you'd be thinking okay this is not going the way i thought and then he says in verse number 35 yea indeed a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. That does not sound like the Christmas story that we sing about, right? Away in the manger, right? Where's the warm and fuzzy? A, a sword is going to pierce your soul, and the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> we all know what I just referred to a moment ago is the warm and fuzzies of the birth of Jesus. It is, it is the story of God coming in the form of a baby, exhibiting weakness, displaying grace, clothing his power and glory in human flesh. And while this story tells that part of Jesus' birth, this story also turns a page and, and pulls back the curtain and and gives us a glimpse behind the veil and reminds us of the sheer shocking force of Jesus' birth. You see, you cannot just look at Jesus' birth and say, hey, it's all good without wrestling through both emotionally and intellectually and theologically the reality of Christ coming. Perhaps <clears throat> this truth is... is best revealed if you think about the most famous of all Christmas music. It's actually, it actually wasn't intended to be a Christmas musical, it was an Easter musical, but Handel's Messiah. Do you remember Handel's Messiah? Right, you kind of sing it in your mind all the time, right? At Christmas. Handel's Messiah contains these words, right? Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah. So here's Simeon, he's lifting up Jesus and he's blessing him and he's saying he's a light to the Gentiles and he's the glory of Israel and then he adds this, 
this Jesus, this baby who's come into the world is going to lead to the falling and rising again of many in Israel. What he's actually say, saying is what Handel is, is communicating in that, in that great musical, Jesus, and this is Jesus' birth, he's come to stake claim over every square inch of the universe. This Jesus has come to stake claim over every square inch of your heart and every square inch of your life. And if you, like Simeon, want to die in peace, if you, like Simeon, want to get to the end of your life and say, I've, I've seen the Lord's salvation, I have the consolation and comfort and hope of Israel, if you want joy in the face of death, then you have to embrace the hope of Jesus coming. Let me explain this to you very quickly. First of all, I want you to see the nature of the hope of Christ coming. Now, you, you, we're going to start out, just kind of define what this is, right? And, and I'm going to go fast. i got 20 minutes and 29 seconds, so let's go fast. Ready? Jesus is the light of the world. Something about Jesus coming gives light. There's, there's two kinds of light, right? I'll give it to you just in a visual way that you can get it. There's light that is illumination or light that is revelation, right? That's what we call the light of necessity. It's light and darkness. Look, for example, Luke 1 verse 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. That, that, that kind of light is this. Like, you, you, you go to bed, right, you turn off, in, in normal households, you turn off all the lights, right? You with me? Then you get up in the middle of the night. Some of you are not old enough to know what that means yet. You don't understand that dynamic. But you get up in the middle of the night, and you think to yourself, hey, you know, I've lived here for a long time. I know my way around. I don't need to turn the light on. And you're stumbling around in the darkness, and then you run into something, that perhaps a grandchild left. If you ever stepped on a Lego piece in the middle of the night, you're, you're like, okay, that, that will just about rob you of every ounce of sanctification you've ever had in your life. So there's light that, that reveals or there's light that illuminates, right? And then there's light that glorifies, right? That, that, that's for beauty. For, for example, I'm, I'm not trying to belittle people, but actually because we do this too, right? But you're, you didn't put your Christmas decorations out and light up your house because you're like, hey, we can't see. You put them up because you're trying to what? You're trying to, you're trying to glorify something. You're trying, to, you're trying to give beauty to something. You're adding beauty to it. So here, specifically, here's the hope of Christ's coming. First, to the Gentiles, his coming is to bring salvation to all people. See, it was the Gentile people that were walking around in darkness. It was the Gentile people that had no idea who the Messiah was and why he was coming. And he says here, it is a Simeon's prophecy, he is a light to lighten the Gentiles. The birth of Jesus is an indication that the good news is actually for every single person, regardless of where you were born, regardless of the kind of life that you lived, regardless of of, of who you are or what your heritage is or your background is or how sinful or holy or righteous or moral you are, your hope is this. Jesus has come into the world to give light, to show that salvation belongs to all people, that even people who are not part of the original promises can be engrafted and included in. So Christmas, the nature of hope, it's salvation for all people. But then it's also this, it's to confirm all of his promises. So Israel knew that the Messiah was coming. They've been told that from the very beginning, right? That the Messiah was going to come in the overarching narrative in all of Scripture is that God made you for a purpose through his creation. You're made in his very image and you find your purpose in, in the image of the God who made you. You find your purpose being face to face with God. The fall tells you you've been cut off. From the image of God, you've been cut off from the face of God. You, you, you are walking in alienation from God. And the promise that God made 
to specifically his people was simply this, that one day my seed, my son will come and he will absolutely obliterate Satan by crushing his head and defeating evil and bringing a cure for sin so that what you were created to be and what you were created to enjoy and what you were created to do will become possible in a relationship with me and the Messiah is coming and he's going to restore the hope to Israel. He's going to say that every single promise that I've made to you is going to be fulfilled and Simeon is holding up this baby and that every single promise is going to be fulfilled in this child. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 says it this way, for all the promises of God are in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Jesus is the yes to every promise that God has ever made to us. So here, here's your hope, right? Doesn't matter if you're first time in church, doesn't matter if you never think about this kind of stuff deeply, doesn't matter where you are in your spiritual journey, the nature of the hope is this. Salvation is for every single purpose and every one of God's promises are gonna be true in Jesus Christ. That's the nature of hope. Number two, the conflict of hope at Christmas. Now, this is where, you know, it's kind of like I'm going to drag you into the deep end of the pool and I'm going to pull you under for a moment. So take a deep breath. I grew up, like I, I'm assuming many of you did, in a home that considers itself, in, in, and I don't mean in an in a inappropriate way, but considers itself in a very normal way to be a Christian home. It was a normal thing for us to go to church. It was a normal thing for us to, to be part of what I would call a, a religious Christian upbringing. And I'm sure that that's true for, for many of you. And, and we have a tendency, particularly in, in what I would call cultural Christianity, and I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, we, we have a tendency to gravitate to the things about Christianity that, that we enjoy, that we like, that, that seems to be, oh, that's a good thing, right? Like, like for example, love your neighbor. That, that sounds like a good Christian thing to do, doesn't it? Here's another one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? That's a, that's a good thing. I love Christianity. God is love. Who doesn't believe that? Well, increasingly, there's a lot of people who don't believe that, but God is love, right? And, and if we would just love one another, and, and we're like, oh, okay, that's the Christianity that I want to be drawn to. When you see Simeon, and he lifts up this baby, and he, and he blesses him, and then he, he looks at Mary, and, and in his blessing to Mary and, and Joseph, he says, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Here's what he's actually saying. You need to understand that when you identify with Jesus, this child who's bringing salvation to everybody, this child who is the the emblematic sign of all the promises of God being fulfilled. This child, if you identify with him, it is going to bring into your life some painful consequences. Say, so, wait a minute, I'd rather go back and just sing away in a manger. Right? Or joy to the world. Right? Or hark the herald angels sing. But Simeon says, there's more to this story. This actually creates a conflict that is going to cause some people to receive Christ, that's the rising again, and some to reject Christ, that's the fall. Anytime you identify with Jesus, there is going to be conflict in your life. There's going to be pain and suffering. The very baby that was born in a manger should have been universally adored. And yet, you know, and I know, as we stand here today, as we sit here today, and we think about it, Jesus, Jesus is both loved and hated in ways that are incredibly contradictory to human reasoning. Now, I'm going to take a moment, real quick, I'm going to get this across to you. Two things, I want you to see this. When he talks about the rising and falling, or the falling and rising again in Israel, he, he's really saying this. 
if, if, you, if you want to get past the conflict, if you want to get through the pain, if you want to get to healing in your life, if you really want the hope to break in, if you want the consolation that, that, that says to, to Simeon, you can die in peace, then first you have to deal with what I'm going to call the repulsiveness of Jesus' claims. See, I, I quoted some things to you that are true about Christianity, but I did not quote to you everything that is true about Christianity. If you think about the claims of Jesus, it'll cause you to maybe pull back a little bit. If you look at the life of Jesus and read the Bible through the lens of what God is going to do to help us in our life to discover the kind of life that we have for us, we begin to see that, that things are not always as rosy or as bright or as, as, as positive as we may think. Because let, let me tell you specifically what some of the things that Jesus, I'm going to paraphrase some of this, right? Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, using an analogy, build your, your life or your house on sand, build your life or your house on a rock. If you build your life on him, you go to heaven. If you reject him, and you, then you go to hell. Wow. The baby in a manger, that, that encompasses that? Or he, he said this, if you believe on him, you're not condemned, but those that believe not are condemned already. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. To the rich young ruler, he said, I have to be more important to you than anything else in your life, including your wealth. And the rich young ruler found that to be so incredibly overbearing and so incredibly hard to live up to that he went away from Jesus incredibly sorrowful. And Jesus didn't call after him and say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't really mean that. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, if you want to be worthy of following me, then your love for me has to be such that it, it, it will look like and feel like that you hate your father and you hate your mother and you hate your brothers and you hate your sister and you hate your wife and you hate your children and only then are you worthy to follow me. I, I didn't say that, Jesus did. It's pretty radical. You say, are those are the most radical things that Jesus said? No, here's Here's radical. You want eternal life? You have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood. Now, my, my point is this. Here's what Simeon is saying is when he's holding up this, this child that we all adore and worship and we say he is the hope of the world. What, what Simeon is actually saying is you've got to get past the repulsiveness and the exclusivity and the shocking reality of what it means to follow Jesus because you have to understand he did not come to just give you what you want in life. He has come to take over every square inch of your heart and life. You not only have to deal with the repulsiveness of Jesus' claims, but you have to deal with the attractiveness of Jesus' claims. See, it's not just the falling, but it's the rising again. That means... You'll never really respond to Jesus until you see the beauty in Jesus. Until you see the tenderness that he has with hurting people, the compassion that he has for lost people, the power that he has over disease and death for diseased and dying people, and the forgiveness that he has for sinful people. In other words, you have to see the beauty in order to get past the hardness and repulsiveness of Jesus' claims. You have to see that everything that Jesus promised you is fulfilled because the most beautiful person that ever lived, the most attractive person that ever lived, Jesus Christ, was absolutely obliterated by God for you. For you. That's the conflict. The conflict to hope. But then let me leave you with this. The response to hope at Christmas. Now, you got to come down to this last little statement that he makes. And I'm going to tie all this together. You'll see it kind of hopefully fit together. It's actually parenthetical. So it, verse 35 really kind of is, is two thoughts that are going to be immersed into one. He says specifically a sword, he's saying this to Mary, shall pierce through your own soul also. He's saying, Mary, your identity, your identifying with Jesus is going to bring pain into your life that is just, it's, it's, it's literally, it's going to gut you. 
it is going to be the most painful thing that you ever go through. And then he says, that's going to happen, because now he's going to tell this in, in response to all of us, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So what is he, what is he saying to us? Well, <clears throat> we all have a choice, right? We either, re, we either receive Jesus or we reject Jesus. The response that you have to Jesus is the issue of the heart. It's actually the test. And the answer to the test is going to be determined by what you do in your heart. It's going to be revealed by the thoughts and the intents of your heart. The heart in the Bible is your seat of intellect. It's your seat of emotion. It's your seat of will. It's where you decide. Until you respond to Jesus, until you respond to the reason for Jesus coming to the reality of who Jesus is, you cannot find the peace and comfort in your heart. In fact, literally, you cannot and you will not die in peace until you settle that issue. I, I, I mentioned it this morning. I think I counted up. If I'm right, I've done 10 or 11 sermons in the last 75 days, a funeral ser services in the last 75 days. So that's about one a week. <clears throat> now, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that because I want you to feel bad for me. I'm just telling you, I've been kind of sucked into what it's like to deal with people who are going through profound grief and sadness. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's actually going to give us an answer to this. He's going to say, you, you've got to think about this sword that's going to go through the, the, the soul. This is spiritual surgery. Th this is the kind of surgery that every single person needs. The Spirit of God is going to do surgery in your inner life, in your heart, in order to get you to change. You'll never find lasting peace and comfort unless the truth of Jesus penetrates your life until the surgeon's sword penetrates your soul. In fact, Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews said it this way, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Let me, let me just very quickly, in these last couple of minutes, give you a couple analogies to help you to see this truth. I'll give you just two. You've got to get them quick. Here's a big, broad analogy, right? So we're all today, right, Europe was liberated in 1945. What are we, we're almost 80, right? We're almost 80 years from the liberation of Europe. There's peace in Europe. In fact, when World War II came to an end, people celebrated world peace, Right? And, and you, can, you can latch on to that. I'm, there's a point I want to make. I want you to get this. There would have been no peace in the world, no liberation of Europe, if there hadn't been an incredibly horrific, violent invasion on the beaches of Normandy in June of 1944. Say, so how did we get to peace? We got to peace through the sword. Can I tell you what Jesus said? I don't come to bring peace. I come to what? Bring a sword. Jesus said that. In other words, he's actually saying to you, if you want peace, you've got to go through the sword. If, if that doesn't help you, here, let me, let me show you my scars from my cert. No, I won't do that. that. Lisa would not like that. I have, I have, I have four scars quick story. <clears throat> Try to do this quick. I found out I had cancer. Went to the doctor. Doctor said, hey, you got uh, cancer. He said, there, there appears to be some, some fairly aggressive radical form of, of cancer cells. And he said, I, I think we, we, need to, we, we need treatment. I said, well, what, what are my options? And he said, well, you could do this option, this option, or this option. I said, well, and, and my wife was with me. I said, well, what do you recommend? He said, well, he said, I might do this or I might do that. He said, but it's up to you, whatever you want to do. I'm like, I, do, I don't know anything about this. That's not my, you know, that's not my area of expertise. What would you do if you were me? He said, well, I don't really know what I would tell you. So I ended up having a conversation <clears throat> with someone, and, and they said, what are you going to do? And I, I just lightly was trying to process. I said, I, I'm thinking about getting a second opinion. He's fairly well connected. I, he said, can I help you? I said, Sure. Next day, I get a phone call from <clears throat> the head of urology at Mayo Clinic. He goes, hey, I don't know 
who you are. He said, but I was told by the CEO of Mayo to call you. I said, oh, good. He goes, I'm going on vacation. They told me I couldn't leave on vacation until I, I, I had an appointment with you. Can you come see me on Monday? I said, sure. He says, well, my plane leaves at 11. Can you be here at 8? I said, absolutely. So I could tell, I knew he was in a hurry, right? And I was kind of anxious to find out what, what he was going to say. And so I walked in, sat down in his office, and he looked at me. This is the first words out of my mouth, right? He, he, the first words to me, he said, you know, you're going to die, right? I'm like, well, yeah, I kind of know that. I was hoping not today. I mean, you know, if we could, if we could make it a week, it would be good. I said, I, I'm, I'm aware. He said, my job is to make sure you don't die from this. I said, okay. He said, exact words, you don't have an option. This is what you need to do. And I said to him, are you telling me that because you want to catch your plane and go on vacation? He goes, no. He said, I'm telling you that because you're not going to die from this. You may die with it, but you're not going to die from it. And this is how we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. I go, well, what's my option? This is what he said. You have to go under the knife. You have to. You don't have an option. If you want to be healed, you've got to go under the knife. If you want to live, you've got to go under the knife. If you want to be whole, you've got to go under the knife. Simeon's holding up this baby and he's saying to Mary, if you want to die in peace, you've got to go under the knife. I'm saying to you, if you want eternal life, if you want the life that Jesus has, if you want the life that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can offer to you, if you really want to know what it is like for Jesus to take over every square inch of your heart, if, it, if you want to know what it is like for you to have a relationship with Jesus that will transform you in a profound way that you'll never be the same ever again, you've got to go under the knife. That means two things. For, I'll get quick. Listen too quickly. You only find hope after repentance. Repentance is, is surgery. It's painful. Repentance is going to pierce your soul. You must change your mind. You must change your feelings. You must change your will in, in regard to the way you think about Jesus. You cannot change yourself. Only God can change you through the gospel. So the way that you get to peace is through repentance. The way that you get to peace is you have to admit that you've done many things wrong. The way you get to peace is you have to say, God, I have been living with a selfish heart. I have a heart that I cannot con control. I have a heart that I cannot change. What I need is your forgiveness. What I need is power from you to be able to change. And my only hope, God, is through your sheer mercy and grace that you will give me what I need. You will let me go under the knife so that I can be healed. Yeah. Repentance is, Lord, I did this because I did not believe that you loved me. Lord, I did this because I did not believe you cared for me. Repentance is, Lord, I do these things or I don't do these things because I do not believe that your love is enough for me. So I keep adding into my life and I keep taking things out of my life that should be there. I keep living in a way that I say that you're not enough for me. I keep depending on things to build my identity, to build my security. I, I keep doing things because I think I have to have those things because the kind of happiness that I'm after, only those things seem to be able to provide it to me. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the knife and I'm going to repent and I'm going to say, Jesus, you're enough. And only then... Only when that sword pierces your soul, when it's Jesus and Jesus only, will the healing power of God's grace begin to come into your life and transform your heart. Secondly, you only find hope after submission. It's absolutely true that choosing to believe in Jesus and follow him is not going to solve all your problems. It just brings a whole new set of problems into your life. So you have to suffer. You're going to go through hardships. You're going to go through pain. Your, your, your soul is going to be pierced with the sword. That's what you're signing up for. But you come to the place where you recognize that, that this is his world. 
every square inch of it, including your life. And when you begin to reckon that, when you begin to to realize that, when the reality of that becomes true, when his love is supreme and his wisdom is truth, you begin to take his word seriously. In fact, what you begin to say is actually this. God, I'm going to submit myself to the surgeon's knife. I'm going to see your word as a matter of life and death. If I obey it, I live. If I don't, I die. That everything that you say to me, even the repulsive things, not just the attractive things, all that you say to me become a matter of life and death to me, and I am going to submit myself to it because you are truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and you do reign supreme over every square inch of this universe, and one day you are going to come to claim everything that is your own, and I want there to be no doubt at all. I want to leave no doubt that I belong to you, that my heart belongs to you. Elizabeth Elliot is perhaps one of the great heroes of the last... 80 years. She was a missionary with her husband to the Aka Indians in South America. She, <clears throat> many of you know the story, she was at home with her daughter when her husband, Jim Elliott, was, along with four others, were, were killed by the Indians in Ecuador. She spent the next decade of her life literally reaching those people teaching them the word of God, translating the Bible into their language, living in the village with the men who killed her husband. When her daughter was nine or 10 years old, she left the jungle, came to America. Several years later, she married a man who was a professor at a seminary in Boston. And she was married to him, I think for about 10 years. So, So Elizabeth would have now been in her 30s. And that husband gets cancer and he dies at a young age. And, and here's, here's a woman whose life is filled with just profound sadness, profound sorrow, profound grief. She, she wrote, she's written numerous books. All of them are worth your reading. Perhaps my favorite little book is, of hers is Suffering is Never for Nothing. She actually, that's her statement. Suffering is never for nothing. God always has a plan and purpose. E- even when he, even when the sword pierces your soul, there's always a purpose for it. Elizabeth Elliot said, the greatest lessons that you ever learn in life, you learn in the deepest waters and in the hottest fires. See, here's Simeon. Here's what he's saying. He's saying this to Mary and he's saying it for you. All your hopes and dreams that will let you die in peace are going to be fulfilled in this baby. And if you believe in him, you're going to, by identifying with him, you're going to invite painful consequences in your life. By the way, here's what he's actually saying. Can I tell you this? He's actually saying to you, that may not put you on a path to get you the happiest kind of life, but it'll put you on a path that will give you the best kind of life. You'll be able to die in peace. Every sorrow of your heart, every emptiness, every heartache, every pain has a promise that will be fulfilled in Jesus. It's up to you. You either go under the surgeon's knife, you either get your life penetrated by the sword, or you fall away. Those are Jesus' words. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Today, I want to just challenge you to do something with Jesus. And, and of necessity, you will. You'll either respond to him and receive him, or you respond and reject him. Some of you are, are living your life, but you're not living his life. He has no claim over areas of your life. There's parts of your life that are completely off limit to Jesus. Those are the areas of your life that you said, hey, That's really mine. I'm going to control that. The God of the universe that's set for the fall and rising of many is coming to take over your life. And you can repent, and you can submit, and you can have the life that Jesus has for you. Or you can reject it, and you can go on living the life that you're living. Are you willing to go under the surgeon's knife? 
will you embrace the sword in order to find peace? Let's stand together for prayer. Father, speak to our hearts. May your word build us up, expose our lives, open us to living the life that you have for us. May we see that everything we're looking for is found in Jesus. We pray in